Welcome back to another episode of Tree and Julia Community Culture, a podcast where we interview different people from across the mutual aid networks that are focusing on permaculture and sustainability. In this episode, we brought on two former guests, Tyler and CJ, who both were in the Garden Commune or Cult with us, and also Joe. Uh, I've been working with Tyler, CJ, and Joe on a new project called the High Desert Institute. We are fundraising to buy land in the desert region so that we can start uh, sponsoring research projects to start looking into different off-grid infrastructure that can thrive in the desert. And then we want to uh, gather the information that we get from all that research and make it available to people in a free open source platform uh, because it feels really important right now for people to you know, share all the uh, experience that we're gaining from our different off-grid projects and have it available um, to, to share freely amongst each other instead of having to buy it. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited about this project. It is actually something that Tree uh, didn't know much about, and so in this episode he kind of interviews the four of us about it. Uh, we talk about you know water solutions in the desert. We talk about uh, post-apocalyptic library, which Tyler is really excited about as a prepper. And we also just go into like, you know, some of our community experience and things that we've learned from our journey in the off-grid community building movement uh, thus far. So I hope you enjoy this episode and I hope you check out this awesome project and get involved. Yeah, so this is oh, a wait. project that came out of conversations at, at the Emberfield Project. There was sort of two conversations. One of them was about what became Radical Raccoons. So the idea is that like the skills and knowledge that it takes to build intentional communities is totally, completely different from the skills and knowledge that it takes to live at them. And there's some overlap, but like it's a whole different set of stuff, right? And like there aren't a lot of people that know all that stuff. And we're all getting a lot of questions now, which we sort of saw coming. So there was this idea of building like a big collaborative how-to guide for all the like main topics and all the like different kinds of solutions, different kinds of problems that you need to find a solution for, like governance and ownership and toilets and water and food and everything else. There are a million options. So like, how do you even learn what they are? And then how do you pick the one that's right for you? And then like, what are some examples of where people have done it that way? And then this kind of has turned into a whole, like much larger, longer project, including the Apocalypse Library, um, which is a lot of that same stuff, plus a lot more. Um, but then... There was also conversations about like, where would we want to do the next ones? Because we have 62 people here who are all building communities. We've built half a dozen of them together, most of us. And um, what do we want to do next, right? Because obviously that's, we all have different visions of the future. And I was talking to people about the high desert and why it's such an exciting place, especially given what we know is coming with the climate change and with political and infrastructure issues and um, the, the reasons that there are all these advantages in the desert that there aren't elsewhere. Um, and so this is something I've always wanted to do because I've spent a lot of time in the desert at intentional communities before I ever discovered the garden. Um, and I think a lot of people are really excited about it. I have a ton of friends here who, who live full time in intentional communities and a, lot, a ton of friends who have already tried to start them and don't necessarily have all the knowledge and skills that it takes to succeed in that. And so it kind of brings together in this new synthesis, the same kind of stuff we've already been doing, but in a new setting where it's really needed and where the knowledge and expertise that we have is enormously important and valuable to the people who are already here trying to do it, but maybe lacking some of that knowledge. And so... You know, whenever whenever I hear advantages of the high desert, I'm a little confused because, like, I'm like, okay, desert, no fucking soil, up in the mountains, hard to get resources. So explain to me, what are the advantages to the high desert? Yeah. So one of the reasons that I'm excited... Uh, oh, sorry. I was just going to jump in. You could probably answer more for the advantages. I was going to say, like, I used to feel a little bit like, you know, why try to make it work off grid in the desert? It's just going to be exponentially harder. But I think the cool thing about this project is kind of like maybe if you can make it work there, you can make it work anywhere of, you know, if we are like researching technologies that can work without much uh, input, you know, like closed loop systems where it's like we're like recycling all of our water and things like that. 
And that's something that could be uh, reproduced anywhere. And no matter what's happening with Are climate change me? in the outside world, in desertification, uh, we can still have systems what that we fuck? can count on uh, without worrying about what might be happening. Uh, so that's why I'm excited about like research projects that can happen in the desert. Uh, as far as advantages, I guess there's the sun, the heat. I don't know. What other advantages? Yeah, so like the enormous amount of solar that's available all year long is huge. Um, the other thing is the traditional building techniques here take advantage of things like thermal mass in a really big way. So if you go to visit the Pueblos, for example, they're building for thousands of years kind of what we would consider earthships, right? Like earthships are sort of a ripoff of the way people have been living here for 40,000 years. And it's stuff that you can find on the ground that they build these homes out of, right? That's, that's this key, the key piece is that it's like local materials that are abundant being used to build homes that are really sustainable, where you can also produce food in greenhouses. Like if you go to Taos, they're growing bananas in the snow using totally passive techniques with 100% recycled and found materials. And so this is also an ancient lake bed. So the ground is potentially pretty fertile. Right? So there are all these projects of converting desert land into arable land using pioneer crops, using all these different reforestation techniques. And um, so like, for example, the community in Gaviotas in uh, Colombia used tree planting and pioneer crop planting to turn a desert into a rainforest. It's totally possible to do that. They planted millions of trees in the desert and it turned into a rainforest. So like here, there are these huge advantages too, where you have upwind, for example, in LA, a lot of air pollution, and it has this effect of reducing precipitation, but increasing humidity. So all of that rainfall that's been lost in places like LA and everywhere in between is now here in humidity. So here in the desert in Arizona, humidity is like 90%. It's, it's more than 90% right now. And like, historically speaking, that's kind of insane. But today it means that there's this option of using atmospheric <laughs> water generators to distill, to create distilled fresh water out of the air in quantities that are increasing because air pollution is increasing. So it's a good example of benefiting from all the things that are going wrong in the world right now and learning to thrive as they get worse based on benefits that it can give you. Right. And there are also tons of, Crops here, like amaranth, for example, that indigenous people have been living on for tens of thousands of years. Amaranth contains all the amino acids. You don't have to eat anything else. And it's delicious, and it grows like a weed in the desert. Um, so there's a, there's a ton of advantages. But as Julia also pointed out, it is kind of hard, right? And doing it here is a good way to demo strategies that will work anywhere. Because when you're, when you're doing it somewhere hard, Lots of other places are easy, right? It's almost like a blank canvas in, in, in a sense that there's no... In, in the desert, is just, there's just nothing. And then so you have no outside influ influences. You just have a blank canvas to start with. So, Which, if you had nothing else, it'd be, it'd be incredibly hard. But putting the systems in place... Uh, you'll know for a fact that what you're doing actually works. And I think the thing people don't realize too yeah. is like when we we were in Missouri, where there's tons of rain, there's it's it's lush, but the the ground is contaminated by farming runoff. You can't drink the water out of wells, and so like even there, you have to use the same techniques of doing catchment, doing alternative forms to get water because the water that's there is contaminated to the point that it's not safe to drink it, even in a place like Missouri. And that's very common. Mm. Yeah. yeah, like, um, you know, when you think of the desert, you're, you're thinking, where the fuck's the water, you know? So, like, and, and whatever, and it's true, like, desertification is inevitable for a lot of land that is now quite fertile and, or, and will, you know, continue to become a desert. So, but of course, water is the biggest thing, right? Or one of the, one of the things, how are, what's, what's some ideas about, you know, how, water, you know? <laughs> yeah. One of the really cool technologies uh, is what's called atmospheric water generators. When you have high humidity, it's really easy to get the water out of the air using technolo this technology. 
And so just like there are solar panels that go on the roof, there are atmospheric water generator panels that go on the roof. And instead of an electrical line coming out, there's a water hose coming out. And it just sits there and converts sunlight into water that it pulls out of the air all day. And so you can get like, for under a grand, you can get industrial size units that'll produce like 80, 800, up to like 8,000 pints of water a day. And you just give it electricity and it just pulls that out of the human. Well, so it's like you obviously you wouldn't need that all the time, but like you could produce way more than you would ever need pretty easily. Wow. Mm. Yeah. So growing up in Iowa, we had dehumidifiers. So is that the somewhat of the same type of technology or is that completely different? It's pretty similar. The difference is, and a lot of people use dehumidifiers that way. The difference is they're not really designed for that. So the metal that they're made of may not be safe to drink. Like, like there could be contamination and there could be like lubricants and sealants and stuff that are, it's not safe to drink that water. And they're, they get moldy because it's not the right kind of metal for, you know, potability, but it's pretty similar. Yeah. Similar technology with slightly different materials. Okay. I remember you mentioning like when we first met CJ and you were talking about studying radically sustainable infrastructure and you mentioned something about like uh, a closed loop system with water where you were like reclaiming water from waste like there were people that were just never needing any more water inputs because they had figured out how to do like, yeah a complete reclamation of it do you remember what that project was yeah so uh it's not it's one of those things that's not totally legal in america but many places around the world it's quite normal so a good example is actually <laughs> in Israel. They have this problem where historically they were over drilling wells and taking too much water. And this, there's no mountain range in between where people are living and where the ocean is, like there is in California. So California has the same problem, but there's a mountain range that prevents seawater from moving up into the water table. So what they had in, in Israel was seawater intruding into all of the the wells and making it salt water you can't drink and so what they decided to do to solve that problem is instead of taking their fresh water that they were using right it goes into the sewer and then in order to release that sewage into the ocean you have to first treat it so that it's drinkable it's called the tertiary standard and we do that here too so any water that we're dumping from the sewer into the um ocean is drinkable and that's insane to me because it's like you could be using this again if nothing else for watering crops right less than 10 percent of the water in the colorado river basin actually goes to people almost all of it goes to industry and agriculture and so it's this huge opportunity and they saw that and they instead of dumping it into the ocean they started dumping it at the top of the aquifer and then it filters through you know, thousands of acres of land and pushes the um, seawater back out into the ocean, right? So now all these people have fresh water in the wells again. And like, that's just one example of something that we really should be doing here. But you can also do that with, for example, aquaponic systems where you have, um, there are already examples in Taos, which are in operation, which you can find on YouTube, which are not legal. And so, you know, uh, it's the kind of thing where like earth ships will oftentimes have like two bathrooms. There's the one you're supposed to use and there's the one that's like for code. Right. And so when you, you have like the code bathroom with the toilet and the septic, but then you have the other bathroom where it's going into like a bioreactor with like sand. And then it's going into like a, an aquaponic system where there's a closed loop of like algae cleaning the water and UV to sterilize all the materials coming in. And you can also do that with the effluent from the um, bioreactors, which is something that Tree and I are both really interested in. So like, for example, if you have a greenhouse, and this is something actually Joe and I have gone and seen too, where you, you can take your, your, you have a, a reactor that sterilizes and removes all the methane from the sewage, and then it goes to feed the plants. The plants drink that, and evaporate it because like 90% of the water that plants drink from the ground, they evaporate. And so you put it in a greenhouse with an atmospheric water generator. And now your greenhouse is distilling sewage into drinkable water in the form of humidity. 
that is totally pure and clean and safe to drink. And it's a completely closed loop system where you don't even need rain catchment at that point because you're recycling 100% of your sewage into fresh water. And that is, is legal, doing it that way, with agreements with plans to evaporate the water. As long as you also have a code, code bathroom. Yeah, it's crazy. Um, you know, on my little bit of research, my understanding of, of course, just in general, when you want to like live on the land, it's all about water management, right? And in the desert, it's going to be one of the hardest places. But if you create swales, um, you can actually create a spring. If you can allow that water to go into the ground, a spring might even come up. Um, but for me, I'm curious about Joe, like on the, um, on the Institute website, I see you barefoot, but I'm curious, what's your plan on the desert while you're barefoot? Your feet are going to be hot, son. What's the plan? I wear a lot of uh, like zero drop barefoot style shoes. Uh, in the desert, there's a lot of cactus or cacti, a lot of spikes and stuff. So it's hard out in the desert. So probably just have to cover up a bit more. I don't know. We uh we had a happening when we were down in uh was southern Arizona where we had like a flash flood kind of warning in the middle of the night and we had to like run out and like cover everything up. And like at the end of it we're just kind of like picking stuff out of our feet just cuz shit happens. But yeah. So but then that was like, actually you know that, that picture was at White Sands. Uh, oh yeah, that was White Sands National Park, which is beautiful. It's one of my my favorite national parks. If anybody gets to go, so then so you know, anyone, as a, as a barefoot <laughs> boy who doesn't want to get hit by cactuses, then what <laughs> you know what what intrigues you? What's make what's why are you passionate about this project? Why am I passionate about this project? Um, there, there's quite a few different reasons. Um, there's definitely a, a major social component to me, like the the project based uh, society where we all get together and we build together and we create together, and the idea of you know work play living all in one space where it's not the walkable city is very intriguing to me rather than you know we're all separated um by our little boxes and very divorced from each other in a lot of ways in our life because of it um there there's uh i like to build things too i'm a professional welder um the a lot of the infrastructure like on land projects or something that is really intriguing to me. Um, I've been watching and reading a lot about alternative housing, which like, I really want to build some domes. I feel like that would be fun or some like subterranean greenhouses uh, that use geothermal to like produce stuff all year round. Um, there's, there's so much to this project that are super fascinating that I'm not going to find in metropolitan Sacramento. So. <laughs> wow. You joined CJ's fucking geodesic dome cult where you're all going to live <laughs> in domes and have a toilet in a dome and have a kitchen in a dome. And right. You, you might be surprised. Some of that might be coming from me. So. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> I, I tell uh, you're in Colorado right now, so you're pretty close to the whole high desert vibe. So this project must be uh, pretty. It comes to your home. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so for me, the the thing that I'm excited about is the post apocalyptic library, and I've been trying to talk about it on, online to to some of my audience without putting it out there that it may maybe uh run into some legal issues down the road <laughs> just can you talk about that cj in, in a way that doesn't yeah yeah how should i talk Put about it AP without English spin on that let's see it <laughs> yeah okay um yeah so like i think what is really exciting is 
the infrastructure of being able to create your own off-grid internet at a community, which was one of the proposals that came out of the first meeting when we voted to create the Permaculture Mutual Aid Network. One of the people there is very concerned with like corporate control of information and wanted to have like some kind of off-grid internet that would have lots of valuable resources and information, but not be connected to these evil corporations and the government and stuff, right? This is a very common perspective in the off-grid community world. And it's also the question was, is there a way we could connect them to each other? So there's like an off-grid internet of like a separate internet. So we can send messages to each other at intentional communities without using the internet. And it was like, oh my God, that's such an interesting project, right? This is what became, actually, he thought of the name, the Cyberpony Express, which is one of the projects we're working on, which is the infrastructure to support the distribution <laughs> of the library. And so there are a ton of existing apocalypse libraries that people have worked on and shared across the internet that contain things that are, they're, they may not be licensed to be doing, right? So what I would say is, what we should be focusing on is the infrastructure to to distribute information and connect the communities to each other using things like radio, um, like Laura radio, which I do a lot of content about, um, which lets you send like a text message, like 20 to 200 miles in some kind of alternative form of Wi-Fi. Like it's wild how much you can accomplish with it. But so basically there's like a box with a Raspberry Pi that's sharing whatever's on it. And so I would put things personally like academic journal articles, open source PDFs and documents about how to do foraging and permaculture. And a lot of the stuff that we're doing research, original research on also being shared that way. And then I'm sure that like a lot of people would also want to put other things on there that they may, you know, like there's this whole like data hoarding community. There's this whole, like there are all these subreddits about these topics, like data hoarding related to prepping and like people who want to do apocalypse libraries and, a lot of the stuff that they're sharing is like, okay, well, you, you, you're putting, like someone is choosing to put like TV shows and stuff on their version of it, which is not what I would be interested in working on. I would be interested in sharing open source licensed, really available academic journal type stuff and the stuff that we're creating. And one of the projects Tree and I were talking about with Radical Raccoons that's much harder than it seemed like it would be, but it's still something that we're working on. It's like my YouTube channel to, to, to create a copy of it that can be shared on the Apocalypse Library, including like a searchable, so like if you wanted to learn about Laura, like where are the 25 videos I made about that? Well, it's actually quite easy to search in this format, right? And YouTube and um, all these other things where it's like, I'm already creating all this content, Tree's already creating all this content, we just need to figure out how to make it indexable and searchable, and then we can distribute it because it's our content that we created through this medium, right? And then I'm sure other people would also want to put, you know, other kinds of things on there, right? But to be clear, that's not what we would be sharing. We would be sharing the infrastructure that allows you to distribute whatever it is that you're putting on there, including, for example, um, like the Internet in a Box project which is this whole open source movement for off-grid communities, especially in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, um, places around Latin America, where there isn't good access to this infrastructure of the internet, right? So that comes with a complete copy of Wikipedia that you can access offline. It comes with a complete medical database. So like there are, there are medical schools using this to teach people how to treat sickness and injuries right all over the world and that's like one of the plugins you just click a box and you've got it right and there's they also have that in like 25 different languages and there's like ted all of the ted videos are on there um all of the khan academy is on there all, a ton of these different kinds of resources is completely on there already you just check a box and it's on your off-grid raspberry pi internet so then it would be like us adding another box that's like include all of this content that we're creating and collecting about how to do infrastructure, about how to do governance models and ownership models. And um, we, the, the, one of the big things is we also want to include this radio connection system to be able to 
send messages to other communities without using the internet. And then um, we also want to sponsor this. So paying for the cost of giving it to communities as much as we're able to so that we can help them set it up and use it and contribute to it and, and contribute new information and lessons that they've learned that can be shared with all these different communities that are using these. So my question to you then is, uh, is there going to be a device that this is can be plugged into or be like, it's just like, here's the, you know, the post-apocalyptic library, or is it like a, like a thumb drive or an external hard drive that you have to plug into something? One of the projects that someone proposed that we approved is doing research about uh, ruggedness for the library. So on the one hand, yes, the Raspberry Pi is great. But Raspberry Pi is probably not going to survive like a solar flare of sufficient size, right? So like, what are some other mediums that you could also share the information through? So including things like if you wanted to be able to save it all onto a flash drive, or if you wanted to be able to like put it all onto your cell phone, right? Like any of these ways that people want to be able to use and access the data, it should be easy. And that's a huge project to make it easy for people to do that. There's also someone who wants to work on different kinds of media. So for example, like optical media, magnetic storage, all these different kinds of media that are more long lived, where like having a Raspberry Pi with a hard drive or like a like a SD card is not necessarily like going to last forever, right? Those have a finite lifespan. Um, so like what happens after that? Like how how many backups should you have? Like, how, you know, all these kinds of questions around making sure that you don't lose access to that because that's the whole point, right? Is that you, you won't lose access to this information. So this is one of the projects that several people have volunteered to, to research, um, you know, and we'll, we'll learn more as they do that research. And I know that's something Tyler, that you're going to be working closely with them on. Um, but yeah, all these are great questions that we're, we're eager to to include our our learning about the answer in the in the content. Wild. Yeah. It's my learning. Oh, sorry, Julia. I was just gonna say, I, yeah, I'm still understanding it myself because I've uh, understood it as like you know we're we're doing this research to uh, create systems for survival for to thrive in an environment despite what's happening in the outside world uh, but then there's also the element of we are documenting how we are doing that and then we are storing that information and we also need to be able to store that information in a way that it lasts despite what is happening in the outside world and can be accessible to people around the world who are off grid, maybe not even by choice. Like maybe they just don't have access to the internet, but these right. technologies could help them also. So ways to like distribute this information um, and create. Yeah. So I, that that's cool. Uh, something I hadn't thought of before is like, you know, how we are documenting it all is also researching how to make that work yeah. uh, in a way that's like indestructible. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What it's crazy. You, what like, I know, CJ, coming? you said, oh, sorry. One, well, I think one, I, like I, for um, me, one of the reasons this is so exciting is because so many different kinds of people have so many different perspectives on how they want to contribute and participate. And like every time someone has a new idea, it's like, oh, my God, that is such a great idea. Let's do that. Right. Like it just becomes so much bigger and more inclusive and more interesting with everybody who pitches in which is like the reason it's so exciting to me oh yeah i i you know you you said that maybe uh educational youtube videos might be in this library but i'm gonna be honest mate like people need porn and my only fans if it's not on there like i'm gonna be disappointed because everyone needs to whack it off every now and again um but that's we'll talk about that next week. Um, so the fucking Grand Canyon, right? Like, what's going on here? Like, are we going to be able to possibly like sustain ourselves in the Grand Canyon? Is that the high desert? Well, not, in, not in it, but above, above it, at the top of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. In yeah. It, a, yeah. So, like, the Grand Canyon is 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 the perfect place to be doing this because there's this really interesting thing happening there right now. If you've been there recently, you may have noticed. It's so foggy, you can't even see it if you're standing next to it. That's not normal. 
the reason that's happening is because of air pollution. And the coal plant that's responsible for that is being shut down, potentially converted to nuclear, which is, we need regulatory changes to make it happen, but it looks like it's going to happen. And one of my friends is working on that. And also, um, it highlights the fact that this change in precipitation from rainfall to fog and humidity is something that's getting worse in general and something that we can capitalize on by using atmospheric water generators to collect that fog and have water that's not raining down, especially in places like the high desert. And the Grand Canyon is like the perfect place to see all of that around you in real time and look at the cause right next to it. You can, you can look at the power plant and look at the fog and you can see what's wrong with the world. And it's the perfect place to do a demo of like, this is a, that's why the idea, the initial name that I proposed for this project is Sky Spring, because it's like a spring from the sky and you pull the water from the air, right? From thin air, all the water you could ever want as a, a direct result of air pollution getting worse. So it's like the perfect spot to tell the story and show it can, where you can just look two directions and see the cause and the effect and how we how we can thrive through the future that we know that's coming, even though things are getting worse, we can be getting better. Mm. Yeah, and, and this kind of technology is like, I think currently in play, even, you know, like it definitely needed in the desert, but it's happening all across the world in places that are way up in the mountains where access to what is hard, they're creating, you know, these big ginormous, like things in the in on the hill that just collect water, yeah. but also farmers are using a small scale version of moisture collection to feed their sheep or their cows or to give them water. Um, yeah. So it's 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 really kind of sexy. Those fog catchers in the Andes Mountains are also completely passive, so they're stretching material between posts, and as the fog blows through, it cools the material down below the dew point, and then the fog condenses onto it and drops into a basin underneath it. And like you mentioned too, there are examples at, um, I think it was Davis doing agriculture this way. So like they'll take two posts and wrap them in saran wrap and then put a basin underneath it and the water condenses onto the saran wrap and falls into the basin and then animals can drink it. Like it's, and there's no power required for any of that. It just works passively. I think one of the nice parts about the being near the Grand Canyon project is the mass appeal as well. Like the general public who's going to come to the Grand Canyon might actually see change at work. Yeah. That's wild. Imagine, oh, I'm just on my family holiday and all of a sudden I can see these billboards of trees only found. Okay, I'm going to stop that. I'm going to stop that. <laughs> um, the High <laughs> Desert Library coming to you live, free porn. Okay. Um, but so also like Joshua Tree, right? Like I've been recently hearing about the this these TikTokers who are buying land in Joshua Tree. That's like literally like sixty feet of land or less for like two grand. They're buying tiny little pieces of property, and I, you know it's yeah. kind of sad that that's where we're at in our world where we're buying these like square feet of land, but. You know, I could imagine them um, for that sort of project, a lot of this infrastructure and ideas could really be viable because people are using this as a campsite. And so imagine if your, you know, your little campsite that you have, you know, was already collecting the water needed for whenever you arrive there. Um, because, so what's going on with a well? Can you, can you dig a, a well in the high desert viable or what's up with that? So it depends. Um... It depends on what's appropriate. What's the appropriate technology, right? Because if you look at Joshua Tree, the water table is like 1,500 feet down. So in, realistically, a well is not a good solution there. Um, and also in California, your well has to have a water meter on it, and you will be charged for the water that you take from the well. Um, which sounds crazy, but it actually makes sense if you have such a limited resource that people are overtapping especially if it's like Nestle coming in to take all the water to make bottled water, right? Like that's crazy. So um, 
it's a question of what's appropriate. But that's another reason that it's really interesting because actually all of these TikTokers who are doing that in California, it is illegal. And at some point they're going to get cracked down on because if you buy land in California that you're going to live on, it has to be up to code. You have to build a house. Like you can't just camp on land that you own in California. It's illegal. And at some point the neighbors will complain and it'll get enforced, right? So that sucks. But one of the questions that's really interesting to me and with other people who I've worked with a lot is like, how do we create like the simplest, cheapest, easiest up to code house that is not just like a tough shed, but is actually designed to be like sustainable, insulated, solar powered, rain collection built in, all of that stuff as cheap as possible up to code. And then people can just do that, there, right? And um, that's like one of the key strategic goals for, for the High Desert Institute, because as Joe is aware, we will have already gone and volunteered on a bunch of these different housing projects where architects, for example, at the Frank Lloyd Wright School are already designing these kinds of homes. And it's a matter of getting a structural engineer to sign off on the plans. And then anyone can build them up to code, right? And it's legal to build something like that in that situation. And that's what's really hard because today you can find all kinds of open source housing plans, but it's always in the context of like, they really want you to buy their fancy one. And the free one is garbage, right? And it's not designed sustainably. It's probably not really up to code in California. And so one of the key strategic goals is finding ways to get these kinds of plans made and distributed as part of the library so that people would have access to some kind of minimal, like affordable, accessible type of home that they could be building. A really good example today is the Mojave Center in California that's doing earthbag and hyper adobe homes. And they're up to code. And it's really, really, really complicated to research that. But once you've got it, you can give that away and anyone can build one and it's allowed. So it's a question of like, bringing together the answers from the people who know it and then making it available to everyone, which is sort of the core of our, our, our project. But especially with the example that you give of, you know, people trying to do that on 60 square feet and, and Joshua Tree when it's, it's really not totally legal. And so unfortunately, at some point, there's going to be a crackdown and it sucks. But then you also have people who have been enormously successful, like Sean Gatz, for example, who is like a walking red flag, right? building a house in a wash in Tucson. And it's like, that's a geographic feature that exists because of repeated flash floods. Like, don't build a house there, right? But people don't know that. Like, I talk about that in videos and people are like, what is a wash? How do I know if I'm buying a wash? And it's like, you know, more good information we need to get out there about like something important you should keep in mind. And like, how do you cite these kinds of things what's a good place to do it just because it's cheap doesn't necessarily mean it's a good place and and what's the difference and how do you how do you tell but there's right. clearly a huge that's a big reason why oh sorry i was just gonna say i think that's a big reason why people choose the desert is you know they want like a lot of people who want to live off grid you know they're not people who have like the a lot of wealth often and maybe anyway and, and so like they choose places like arizona for example all these other places in the desert where they can get cheap land um and so yeah. they're really starting at that that space and it's, it's really tough and there are some really good finds like there are, there are really good spots yeah and in, in colorado okay uh, uh... So, so I was just gonna say, in Pablo, Colorado, there is extremely, extremely cheap land because it's just nothing. So that's another, another, another about obtaining some cheap land. I'm talking about like $500 an acre type of cheap yeah. land. I, I think one thing that's, that's hard because it's so desolate or. Yeah. It's also like, how do you, how do you tell? Like, what are the things you need to look out for? If you're trying to buy land in the desert, how do you know if there's some kind of existential threat on the land that you're buying that you may not be aware of? Like, what are the things you need to be paying attention to? And showing examples of how people did that and like teaching people all of the, the key points and like looking at like, here's a person who did it. This is what went wrong. Here's how you can avoid that. 
putting all the information together is so valuable. And there are, there's a whole industry of people trying to sell you an ebook about it, right? But there's not like a right. Wikipedia of that. Mm. One of the things I really so, like about uh, a lot of the naturally built homes, like the earth bag and stuff, is that it's like, it's not very expensive and it's not, it doesn't require that much technical skill. It's like people powered. It's just like extremely labor intensive, but it's like, it's kind of beautiful in that way. Like I really resonated with what Joe was saying of just like, you know, the joy of like working on projects outside with people in that community setting is, is one of like the biggest appeals of this whole lifestyle for me. So I like that a lot of the tech that goes along with uh, this, uh, this environment is kind of already has that built into the framework of it. It's like, it's not one person who's really good at it doing it. It's like, you need like a hundred people uh, with any kind of skill, just stuff in bags and stuff, you know, you know um, I like that about a lot of hob building and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. A and lot it's of people. Commute. Oh, oh. Yeah, like Joe? groups coming together to build a common project. Uh, you know, you're going to have your hardships, you're going to have your ups and your downs and people have to, navigate those together and then at the end you can have your sexy party in your sexy dome hey <laughs> now we're talking people I are figure out one for you tree thank you mate people are gonna be <laughs> thinking though like i know domes are great but you know everyone's gonna be wondering are you guys gonna be building earth ships now i've heard earth ships are great but i've also heard there's some specific um issues with airships like tires being toxic to humans <laughs> exactly yeah that's michael one. reynolds has cancer yeah, that's a big one. their time <laughs> <laughs> yeah wow. joe and i just went and with them and uh that was one of the things that came up is like what like the tires are ostensibly there for thermal mass because you fill them with dirt but they're actually not very good at that. Like water is much better at that. Like using a water tank as the inside of the wall would be a hundred times better than using tires. And water is not carcinogenic, right? Like that's why like the, the, the Pueblos are made with like just dirt and uh, adobe and like logs, right? Like you don't need tires. There's no advantage to tires. The only advantage to Michael Reynolds of using tires is the fact that he is paid by tire shops to dispose of them as toxic waste. And instead of disposing them, he uses them to build people homes that he sells. And then people get cancer, right? This is why tires, there used to be like chopped up tires used in kids' playgrounds, right? But like the kids all started getting cancer. So we don't do that anymore. But Michael Reynolds is still selling people houses made of the same toxic waste, you know, while he has cancer for the third time. Like it's nuts. So like a lot of those yeah. concepts are good, but then some of it, it's like, oh my God, why would you do that? You know? Are you, I, but what is what you just described? Were you talking about like, like lining walls of your house with water as thermal mass or just like building water, big building, big water storage into your house as thermal mass? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so like the newer Earth ships, what they have is um, there are, there are some tire walls, right? But then in the there's a south the south facing side is like a hill, so it's all completely buried under multiple feet of dirt, and inside of that hill is very large water tanks, and the water from the roof goes into those tanks, and then it's filtered when people want to use it. So it's a much better insulator much better thermal mass than anything else. Nothing in the universe compares to water as a storage of uh, heat or of, as a sink of heat. So like to take the heat away or to give you the heat back, whatever you're trying to use it for, nothing in the universe compares to water. The universe? Well, CJ, I know you're taught, you know a lot, but the universe, bro, you have not explored space. Don't tell me you've explored <laughs> space. I know exactly. you know the high desert. You know the West, but <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's an easy science experiment that people can do. Uh, you can you can put more water jugs in your refrigerator, and your refrigerator will run more effectively. Yep. Whoa, yeah. Whoa, that makes sense. That's 
Okay, because wow, can you, like, say that, like, m- with more statement? Because that's fucking, whoa. I'm going to put that on TikTok. That's be- That's crazy. What? <laughs> oh, my God. All right. I want to say this out loud. I am not a TikTok influencer. Uh, that's all you guys. Like, good on you. Do that up. I love that. I'm, <laughs> I'm not <laughs> super stoked <laughs> about being a face and a name. I, uh kind of like what? just floating through the world and doing my thing uh, oh, okay so I'll, I'll edit i'll edit your face so it you don't know it's you you'll look like a little puppy dog and you won't be ginger make, make me anymore. more ginger oh, make more me more ginger, ginger. oh yeah okay <laughs> okay okay jim so at, burning man, at burning man we have uh these big <laughs> commercial like trunk freezers that we use as fridges for the camp that i'm in and um the, there's this trick where you can put a different thermostat like with, they have those thermostats like for chicken coops right where it has the heater and it ch- turns on and off at certain temperatures so you just use that to turn the freezer off when it gets to fridge temperature so it's not working as a freezer it's working as a fridge and then what you do is you fill the whole bottom half of it with containers of water and because water has this special property of being able to wiggle in more directions than any other kind of molecule, it can store orders of magnitude more enthalpy or like the energy of heat than any other molecule. Uh, and it's this very, it's, it's, this is why like our whole, all of life is built around water. Water has all these very special properties that no other molecules have, including the highest enthalpy, right? So when you do that with these freezers, there's actually all kinds of plans online where you can find um, people have modified these trunk freezers when you fill them half with water and switch them to be a fridge where they require almost no energy. And they can go multiple days without being plugged in and maintain the temperature because of this special property of water. It's pretty wild. The special property of wiggling. I didn't know water wiggled. So, you know, a crazy thing for the high desert, right, is, you know, of course, there's, there's cheap land there, but I think um, it's also one of the highest uh, growing populations currently. You know, people are moving there. Friggin' Phoenix is the biggest city in the U.S., you know, like, uh, you know, sprawled out. You know, yeah. so many people are moving there. So this is like really powerful information for the people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There was this guy one thing 200 years ago. Really excited. Oh, yeah. There was this guy 200 years ago named John Wesley Mead. And um, he was the head of the U.S. Geological Survey. And he wrote a, popula- uh, uh, a report called um, a Report on the Arid Regions. And it was a 200 page report where he said if we try to build cities the same way in the Southwest, it's going to cause a lot of problems with water management, water waste, water rights, and political conflict around that. And he predicted literally like all of the stuff that's going on today with water. And he's like, if we try to build a city, like he essentially describes Phoenix, he essentially describes Vegas. He's like, if we try to do that, like we are going to fuck ourselves, right? Uh, And he spent 200 pages about like, don't build dams don't build lakes don't try to turn the colorado river into a series of lakes that is a terrible terrible idea don't try to irrigate deserts to grow farms and they named the lake after him and they did it anyway and now we have all the problems that he predicted we could avoid like it's wild so building these alternative systems where we're not doing all of that stuff or we're not you know like fighting with corporations on whether water is a right that we have uh, because instead we're relying on catchment and are producing our own, producing the sources of fulfillment of our own needs instead of renting and buying them from corporations. It's a much better system. I have a right to wiggly water. That that needs to be a brand. If we're going to sell water, I, I know we shouldn't be, but like if we did, we should do that. Or how about like a, some sort of irrigation, right? Or like the moisture capture, we can call it the air wiggler. I don't know. Anyway, so one of the cool things for me about the desert is ditches. You know, like it's all about water, right? And so for me, I, I find I, working with nature, 
And if you can just make a fucking ditch, right? You make a circle, a hole, and you dig a fucking hole, a big one, not too deep. You can just grow food right there or grow anything. And you can desert, desertify yeah. the desert by just digging a yeah. hole where the water is going to be catched and planting something. And people are doing this currently. You can check out the Leaf of Life a YouTube channel. They're amazing. And they just bought land in the in Mexico, in the desert, where they're literally doing this for us as an example to show that it can be done. And they're, you know, they're documenting the whole process. So they bought a little bit of land and they're building these swales and they're building these ditches and they're just planting a bunch of stuff and they're going to turn it into an oasis. And I can really see, you know, like this organization what's next? You know what I mean? Like we've got this, you got this library vibe going on. Absolutely cool. But you know, people are going to want, you know, the vibe and, and, and yours. I don't know. What, what am I saying? I you just got this. You are doing amazing. What's the yeah. trajectory is what so, trying to say. <laughs> well, one of the things Thank that you. we've already. Yeah. So, so China. So I think China did this recently. So, so China, uh, they, a lot, of, a lot of their their country was turning into a desert, and they mitigated this by planting a bunch of trees. I'm talking about millions upon millions of trees, and it's helped, and it's actually moved, it stopped becoming a desert in a lot of those areas. Yeah, one of the big projects that we've got is yeah. uh, one of there's like two programs. There's guest research and there's special projects. So special projects includes like people that want to build something, right? So like. This is why we're fundraising to buy land, because we want to build demos of all of the different options for all of the different solutions for the problems that everyone is going to have to solve. So like if you you're like you're, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you have to have a solution for like food, water, shelter, HVAC, right? Um, connectivity to the outside world. Like there's a million ways to do each of those. So we're going to build demos to explain like, here's how you do it. And then we're going to create content about that. And we're going to tell people, come take a look and talk to us and like physically touch it. Right. Um, including like re reforestation is a huge thing. And agroforestry is a huge thing, particularly in Arizona and California and Southern California and the high deserts. All over the world, people are doing all these different strategies of reforestation right now. And especially here, I recently spent a day with Arizona's chair of agriculture talking about the intense need for agroforestry. Um, Julia, related to your, uh, degree, um, Joe and I just went to see the biosphere project in Oracle and they have this huge exhibit on, um, like we don't understand how water moves through the ground. That's something that humanity doesn't understand and like how it's affected by different kinds of materials, how toxins and pollutants travel with it or don't and why and what the differences are and how we mitigate those things. This is the bleeding edge of science today, which this is, so this is, Julia got a degree in this, right? And like, they're doing all these bleeding edge experiments in Arizona right now with their, they have this huge intense um, agricultural focus on like, how do we manage forests and water and all of these things that are so important that are currently just sort of like, not, there's, we just have no understanding of how these things work and what the solutions are. But this is a huge thing, especially because the zones are moving now so fast. So there are all these test gardens in Arizona trying to um, figure out like what like what can farmers even plant next year that's going to grow. Like people are people may not be aware, but we have like widespread crop failures for a long time. Like many of our crops are failing every day. We and we experienced this with like cold snaps that like killed all the buds on the fruit trees, right? Like. This is something anybody who grows food is aware of is like, it's hard to guess what's even going to grow. And doing these gardens at these kinds of places is a great way to test as the zones continue to move, what can people grow next year, right? So that's an example of a good kind of relationship we could have with an institution like the Rocky Mountain Institute that's doing these test gardens all over the country to try to see what, what forecasts they can make on how these plants are doing. And that's something that I've volunteered on, you know, in the past, but it's something that I think we have a huge opportunity to, to take 
like this, it's not just about like cultivating and distributing information, but it's also about generating like new knowledge about all these problems and how they're getting worse and how the problems are moving. And um, I think that's, it's key. Yeah. Cause as everyone points out, like there's examples in Colombia, there's examples in China, but it's like, okay, what about like, what, what is Arizona going to do? Like, what is Utah going to do? Right. And we have to, we have to find the answer by doing research. And it's not happening enough. So there's this huge need for, for everything that we're talking about to be done here. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot more talk of like reversing climate change or slowing climate change more than like mitigation of what is already definitely going to happen. And it seems like probably a lot of it is already known. Like maybe we know exactly like how these plants react to those temperature changes and how, and we could be documenting it and spreading it to each other. Uh, because there's maybe a lot of places too that it could just be slight adjustments that they would have to make uh, in order to, you know, like, oh, this area is going to be like this. So you probably, if you're going to plant trees right now, make sure you're planting ones that are resilient in the, or the cold hardy, or maybe they come from this zone and they can survive in your zone and they're going to do really well in 10 years yeah. when your zone is more like that zone. Um, and that, you know, that kind of information should be available to anybody who's trying to make their property um, more resilient. Uh, you know, because we could yeah. be planning, you know, with like, like how I was saying at the garden, you know, we're, we're like acting, you know, we're growing food and doing all these things as if things are going to keep being how they are, but they're, they're not. Uh, and so we have to be a couple years ahead, you know, uh, and planting things that are going to be able to survive. Right, um, right. And yeah, I'm really excited for, in terms of next steps, like, I think biggest thing is like fundraising for this land we keep like spreading the word about what we're doing um and once we actually have a land project it's going to be really fun to just have like a, a home base that we can start seeing evolve um and kind of similar to how i see like the garden in tennessee as like it is like this you know accumulation of all these different people and all these different ideas and experiments over the years uh and you know but then doing that with uh like really intentional uh research-based projects that are funded and uh documented um and then you know in the end result we'll create a resilient space just through researching how to do it you know what i mean like i can see in 10 years from now there'll be a community spot where people you know all those that are physical in there and it's also kind of like a, a museum for people to go through and be like oh okay. so, you know here's where we went wrong and here's where we went right and here's what you know um, so I really yeah. like the idea of that, of imagining where this project could be in like 10 years of, yeah, uh, all the, the physical representation of the research that we're going to do. Cool. Yeah. The thing that was really frustrating for me about visiting the Earth ships is like they have, you can see there's like a water system, but if you want the explanation, you have to buy the book. You know, and it's like, that is so not helpful, right? Like, especially because, like, how many people can even go see that? Versus, like, you have to pay $200 to find the answer to your question. Like, that's insane. We're, we, I, like, we have this huge opportunity to fill this, this void of so many people wanting to know how to get ready for what's coming and how to solve these kinds of problems for themselves so they don't have to worry about that but like everybody's trying to sell them an answer that's probably not even that good right where it's like there's a hundred options for the answer and you have to figure out which one works for you and if you have to pay 200 bucks for each one like it's never going to happen you know the other thing too is tree i know you're really interested in biochar biochar is one of the leading arguments for how to make crops resilient against unexpected changes in temperature and precipitation because it increases the health of the rhizosphere and the the microbes and the uh fungi and the bacteria and the all the things that the plants are relying on that are really really affected by changes in temperature and that leads to the plant not being able to survive when the temperature changes biochar is the answer to that what a microbe what the heck is a microbe what are you talking about i don't know what do you <laughs> don't speak to me in technical terms okay i only know the physicalities <laughs> a fire 
I piss on it, and then it's charcoal. I don't need to know anything more, right? No technicalities. That's fucking not. That's absolutely amazing. I, you know, it really is the, the coming of age, you know, for biochar and pee. Right here on Long Island, yeah. there is the one of the first studies, scientific studies, on urine and uh, biochar. So, you know, it's it's really coming up, and I'm on the edge of it. Um, I'm edging right now for a piss, to be honest. Um, I, I wish I could be peeing onto some charcoal and fertilizing the, yeah. your land or whatever land, whoever's land. I don't know whose land it yeah, is. Yeah. You know, if it is a land that you still get, you know, like you'll see me there only if you can have a pot, if we can party there. If we can't party there, then fuck off. You know, I'm going to be somewhere else. But it's fucking <laughs> beautiful, guys. I, I fucking love mm. you. This is, this has been amazing. So, so people, what, you know, what, people in the some, desert, what, they want to be a part of this project. <laughs> huh? Let's answer that. Let's answer that. Let's talk a little bit about the, the governance and ownership model that we wanted to do and why. Um, because it's different than what we've done before. Tell me about it. And this is, this is a, an important difference. You guys talked this morning, um, Julia and Tyler, about like one of the big sources of conflict and tension at Emberfield was the people who were like, this is going to be my house. And the people who were like, I absolutely have zero intention of living here. I'm here to volunteer to help build it, right? And there was this kind of like, who are you to decide right. things? You don't actually even want to live here. This is my house. I should be telling you how to do what you're doing, right? And it's this weird tension of like, who is just visiting and who is actually is like a legitimate part of the group. And I think that is such a waste of time and energy, right? And so like, I think of like, a, a way better model, and I've been we've been talking about this for years, but like my preferred model is the syndicalist model that it's more like a labor union where like we are this not for profit group where like we're not being compensated, we're fundraising to fund research people want to do and projects people want to do as volunteers, and we're helping pay for it. And then it's it's like tr if Tree wants to come teach the world about biochar and why you should be peeing on your charcoal. How can, like, like my role in that is like, how can I help Tree accomplish that? It's not like, is this your house or is this my house? Like, that's just such a waste of time, right? Like, like we can all, there's plenty of room for everyone. There's plenty of everything for everyone. And what we should be focusing on is how do we help Absolutely. this person who wants to teach the world about something important? How do we help them accomplish that? And so the nonprofit model with like fundraising to, to fund research and projects with um it not being like whose house is this and instead being like how can i contribute to all the projects people are doing to teach the world about the answers to the problems they have so that's like a way better model in, in my opinion i think uh so most of us probably have okay. a similar i think we've already obviously talked about this but i think a lot of us have different slightly different angles or perspectives on that. i wonder if others would want to share what they what they think about that so are you um, so are you saying that yeah. it's a model based on in peer intentions? Like depending on what people's intentions are, it's like, yeah, absolutely. That sounds awesome. Come come do that. There there's uh, an application. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, there's there's an application process <laughs> and then the project is approved or or not, depending on the ask. Like for example, we approved a bunch of the project applications. There was one where the project was like, I want to I have this exciting project, but I need like 40 grand. And it's like, okay, well, we're, we don't have that right now. Like let's maybe someday we can do that. Right. But within the limitations of what we actually have to give people, uh, assuming that, you know, the project has value and um, we can afford it. Yeah. Sorry. What were you saying, Joe? Oh, I was going to say, um, with this model, like we've talked about this a lot. We've been to a lot of different places and seen people build a lot of amazing things. But at the end of the day, the person whose name is on the ownership document just doesn't want to let go and let the community become a community. And like, uh -huh. it just kind of like stops everything dead and like yeah. we we went to Arcosanti and Paulo Scolari, like classic example of this. We talk about this a lot. Like he lived into his eighties and he was still going to the gift shop, checking on the register every day. 
and you're just like, okay, you weren't, you weren't in it for building the walkable city where everybody can work and play it and do their thing together. You just couldn't let go of the purse strings. Mm. Yeah. And it was just kind of like, okay, this, this place could be amazing and we could, you know, it could be this very vibrant place, but it just never, you know, it never got over that bottleneck of, I don't know, power maybe. Yeah. And also, I, I think, think they're, they are really working. People get older too. As people get older too, they, they tend to get more that way. So even if they maybe like people starting out, it could be an interesting one of like, how to not get like that <laughs> if you're starting a land project or like, yeah, de constant detachment with your project or like focusing on, you know, the greater goal, like you were just saying of like, um, we're trying to teach these, the world this thing. So that should always, you know, uh, come first um, and not letting your personal needs like get in the way of that, uh, which is uh, definitely an ongoing struggle for everybody, you know, um, and I, you know, I think uh, I was thinking about it when you said, like, okay, so I see the garden in Tennessee as a place uh, that uh, emphasizes those same uh, uh, ideas of making sure that, you know, this is a place, this is no one's home. That's not what it's about. It's about this greater mission. And, you know, when you're here, you're kind of like, that is what you're working for is you're not working with making this your at home. And that was something that, you know, that as like a hub of like the people's project has been um, a lot of people's focus for a while. Um, but um, there's also downsides to that of like, if nobody is permanently there, then um, it's hard to look after livestock or have like consistency of projects or like projects that require like daily attention from somebody who knows them intimately. Um, and so I, in creating Ember Fields, uh, it was actually something that I pushed for a lot was, you know, I want to think about who in our network of like, who wants to be somewhere more permanently, who is looking for that? Um, because there's a lot that then you could offer to the mutual aid networks of like, oh, then you can really have like consistent, like every year we produce this honey, we jar it and we set, like, that's something you can only do if you really invest years into a place and you your lifestyle is like you know um it, it's kind of hard to do when you're constantly passing the baton like at the garden it's even the chicken even taking care of the chickens is sometimes hard because we're constantly passing who's taking care of the chickens you know um so yeah it's something i was interested about is like seeing how a community changes when people are really thinking about i'm gonna live here um and then it also you know it created a lot of barriers of them there's a protection and then there's you know um so yeah i don't know just a, a thought for upsides and downsides of those different models you know and a lot of these things probably can only be ironed out by actually getting dirty and doing the thing right yeah absolutely absolutely dj well uh, what did you say the the name of this model was syndicalism it's a it's a, it's it, it's the Latin word for what we would today like the closest the closest thing in Latin to what we would today call um, like labor unions revolutionary syndicalism the idea that like people who are working together on something organize around the work uh, are very effective at accomplishing the work right so like communes are kind of a different model especially like an egalitarian commune is a, a very different model where the the thing you're organizing around is the, the place and um, having the place and being okay, um, but not so much the work. And so you often, like in anarcho-communist models versus anarcho-syndicalist models, the difference is that in anarcho-communist models, um, you typically evolve towards this plateau of uh, not being able to agree about anything, in, especially in very large organizations. Uh, where like it becomes harder and harder to have to, to continue to have consensus about changing anything um, because the goal is really the place and for the people who already have it right to continue to have it um, without it being different in any way that it might need to change to accommodate some new group, for example. And so like we see this in, in the, the nonprofit world a lot because most nonprofits are sort of organized in this sort of loosely 
and calm sort of way where it's very different with syndicalists where like you have labor unions constantly trying to do the work better for and and especially from the perspective of the workers so like if the work is this project that we're all talking about and the goal of the organization is to make that better and make it work better for the people who are working on it that um that is what's going to happen right so like the, mo- the the focus of the model is what it achieves and in this case the focus of the model is the project and the work that we're doing together on it also by the way um there are all kinds of exceptions to things like like um for example it's totally fine to provide on-site housing to people who are involved in the work like that's totally legal um and like having those things be tied together, I think makes a lot of sense. Like if at some point if we're able to invest in building housing at the the land, um, that would be fine, right? Like if we get to that point and it's, it's totally legal to do that for people who are working on a project to have a place to stay or a place to camp, right? Like if people have camper vans, I know all of us have, you know, traveling camping setups. Um, and so like, just like we did at Emberfield, like that kind of stuff would be totally fine. Um, and I think like all of us agree that it's fine for people to be staying there if they're contributing and working on something, right? Like, but it's not like my house or like your house. It's not like, it's, it's a place where people go to do work and research on solutions and educating the world about important things. So I think I I guess that's the difference between like, like a communist model and a syndicalist model. It's fo- it's focused around the work instead of the instead of around being mm-hmm. a community. You know what kind of model I want? I want a fucking hot walk model. You, me, the whole lot of us walking down the desert with our bare feet, not Joe but Jim, like going down there. And fucking <laughs> on on this new piece of land, modeling fucking my crop tops, which you can all get. But anyway, do we? Are we done? I think we're done. <laughs> can we find you. that in, uh, in your TikTok shop? Oh Click my below. gosh! Yeah, it's nature dot shop. You can you can have a piece of me, literally. It'll come. <laughs> it'll, if it'll, if you buy one, it'll come with a piece of me. If anybody wants Free to see Joe, Joe's feet pics, you can go to the highdesertinstitute.org and um, <laughs> read his bio with, that has his feet pics on there. <laughs> and please donate because we have a strategic goal of keeping the average donation low. Last time we did a GoFundMe to buy land, the average donation was like $7.50 and we were able to buy the land. And today our average donation is like $33. So that is too high. If people could donate less than thirty-three dollars, then we can get the average donation closer to the strategic goal of being like around ten dollars or under. That would be ideal. This fucking strategic goal, I am very intrigued by it. Imagine saying donate uh, less. I am I am this is very <laughs> interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. I donate three dollars. Well, I think it's five dollars. It. Yeah, yeah. Because if we have, if like, a few people dead, donating a lot of money, 30, if we have a few people donating a lot of money, then those people have a bigger voice than, like, like that would be bad. Like, we want to have a lot of people donating a small amount of money, just like we do with your 2DR project and with, uh, you know, the previous land yeah. projects, because then we're engaging a large audience instead of engaging investors. We don't want that, right? Dude, that fucking makes a lot of sense, you know? Because whenever we did buy the lake land, there was a guy who donated a big chunk of money. And he was always like, so what's going on there? And we always felt so nervous that we had to like provide to him some sort of information yeah. on what we were doing. And maybe some, we were like doing it for him at some point, you know? Like, oh shit. You know, like that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. All right, I fucking love Joe, you guys. Have you, do you, do you, do you guys have anything to say? Feel free. 
Get it out there. Tell the world. <laughs> uh, where can you find your feet picks? <laughs> Was it highdesertinstitute.com? Oh, yeah. Um, that's, that's right. Yeah. Just make sure you all go there and check that out. <laughs> dot org. Oh, there you go. Highdesertinstitute.com. It redirects to wow. that. It redirects. Okay. It redirects. All right. So. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we haven't done everything. But yeah, I, I would say that was that's I the bet. main plug Don't of this entire G-X-Y. podcast for sure. Check out our website. <laughs> follow along with what we're doing. Sorry, guys. Uh, just... And get in early and yeah, <laughs> come on the journey with us. I'm really excited. And people can also suggest things that it, like I'm sure there's so much uh you know, different ideas that can come out of this topic. So if anybody has ideas, you can comment on this video. Let us know uh, what you think we should research um, because it's still evolving. It's in the beginning stages. So uh, we're all really excited to see where it goes. And the project applications are open. So if people have an idea for a special project they want to do, if they want to learn about something and teach the world about it, the applications are open. You can just fill it out on the website and let us know what you want to do, and then we'll be in touch. And I think eventually we want to create like a functionality where the website then people could, uh, we could have potential projects and then people could donate directly to funding that specific project and stuff like that too. So uh, if you don't have funds to start the project, don't yeah. worry about it. If it's good enough an idea and a lot of people want to see it done, uh, we'll make it happen. Yeah. Cool. I'm so well, excited you to be working on this with you guys. It was great chatting. Yeah, I can't. I, yes, I can't wait you. till the institute figures out the high desert in my pants. You know, you need to do some research on that. All right, I fucking love you. High desert institute <laughs> dot org. <laughs> Cheerio! Thanks for tuning in. Love you. Bye. Love you all. All right, love you guys. It's a desert in there. <laughs> <laughs>